it's not how you see or talk about your business. It's all about how people experience it. Great businesses are built on great experiences. My name is Big Navigators and I'm design team lead in Shift4 Payments. This video is about goal direct design and the most important aspect of building user personas, user goals. Alan Cooper, a noted pioneer software developer, proposed the concept of user personas and goal directed design process. Goal directed design process describes a six step uh, process for talking to users, analyzing what they say and do, and most importantly, um, making decisions about whether different users can be satisfied by the same interface or will require different interfaces, features, or flows. In this video, I will talk about two steps of that process, research and modeling. The first and most important step is to recognize and understand who your audience is. Users are more than ones and zeros. They are people who are looking for the perfect solution to their needs. Customer has a job to be done, the goal, and he's seeking um, to hire the best product or service to do it. Um, the brilliant statement by Harvard marketing professor Fyodor Levitt, people don't want to buy a quarter inch trio, they want a quarter inch hole. Um, it's brilliant because it, it illustrates in the simplest of terms why you need to sell results, not the product or its features. And, you know, when I bought a drill, uh, I have no use for a hole. My, my family won't be better because I drilled a hole. So when I bought um, a drill, I didn't pay for holes. Uh, the holes uh, was uh, the immediate result. I used a drill to create extra storage space by hanging shelves, hooks and racks in the garage or hanging the paintings and pictures on the wall. The extra storage space or hanging picture was the end result. And that's uh, what I had in mind. Uh, that was my goal when I got the drill. So the drill is competing with glue and other products that might cover my need to hang something on the wall. So what are user goals, how can we identify them? Uh, how do we know that they are real goals rather than tasks users are forced to perform by poorly designed tools or business processes? Are they uh, the same for all users? Now, goals are not the same as tasks or activities. A goal is an expectation of an end condition, where is both activities and tasks are intermediate steps that help someone to reach a goal or set up of goals. Um, consider our PR system. Uh, waiters who use this product are paid based on how many orders they handle. The um, most important concern is not of um, is not ease of learning, but the efficiency with which way can serve customers and they rack with which those customers' orders can be completed. Um, if you are still um, unsure about the difference between goals and activities or tasks, there is an easy way to tell the difference between them. Since goals are driven by human motivations, they change very slowly, if at all, over time. Activities and tasks are much more transient because they are based almost entirely on whatever technology is at hand. So, for example, when someone travels from San Luis to San Francisco, his goals are likely to include traveling uh, quickly, comfortably, and of course, safely. In 1850s, a uh, settler wishing to travel quickly and comfortably would have made the journey in covered wagon. And in the interest of safety, he would have brought on his trusty rifle. Today, uh, a businessman traveling from St. Louis to San Francisco makes the journey in a jet and in the 
interest of safety, he's required to leave his firearms at home. Uh, the goals of a settler and businessman remain unchanged, uh, but their activities and tasks have changed so completely with the changes in technology that they are, in some respect, in direct opposition. So, how do you define user goals? What are type of user goals? Alan Cooper describes those as life goals, reflective one, uh, who user wants to be. Life goals represent the user's personal aspirations that typically go beyond the context of the product being designed. End goals, behavioral, what the user wants to do. Now, end goals represent the user's motivation for performing the tasks associated with using a specific product. And experience goals are visceral, how the user wants to feel. Uh, this goal provides focus for product visual and aural characteristics. Uh, it's an interactive feel, such as animated transitions, uh, latency, touch response, and uh, a button snap ratio, clickiness. Um, it's physical design and it's micro interactions. Um, but, you know, in order to define the goals and group them, I also use job to be done framework to extend the goals. There are two different types of jobs to be done. Main jobs to be done, which describe the tasks, um, tasks that user want to achieve and related, uh, related jobs to be done, which uses uh, want to accomplish in conjunction with the main job to be done. Then within each of these two types of jobs to be done, there are functional job aspects, the practical and object, uh, objective user requirements, and emotional uh, job aspects, uh, the subjective user requirements uh, related to the feelings and perception. Finally, emotional job aspects are further, further broken down into personal dimension, uh, how the user, wants, uh, user feels about the solution and social dimension, how user believes he or she is perceived by others while using the product. So I will give you a small example. Uh, which, a weighted job is to serve customers in the restaurant. An important functional aspect of this job is to provide an excellent uh, weight service um, while taking customers' order and delivering food and beverages. Emotional, a personal aspect is to feel that you are doing your job properly. Um, social dimension is to ensure that you are perceived as a, a professional that is capable to ensure satisfaction uh, of customers. And related jobs might uh, be to have the ability making menu recommendation, recognize regulars, uh, and, and etc. Now, uh, how do you create uh, jobs to be done? So first of all, you need to create a job statement. A uh, key component of job statement are an action verb, the object of the action, and clarification of the context in which uh, the job is performed. Um, example, take customer's order in the fine dining restaurant. Now, when you have the statement, of the job, um, you are capable to create uh, outcome expectations. Uh, what criteria would uh, the user use to decide which solution to hire or use? Outcome expectations are solution neutral and reside at a um, uh, higher level. There are four types of outcome uh, expectation. Uh, desired outcomes users wants to achieve. Uh, undesired outcomes users want to avoid, Desires, uh, desired outcomes providers like a company that create product want to achieve and undesired outcomes providers want to avoid. So, for example, the job of taking the customer order in the fine dining restaurant has many associated outcome expectations. Um, such as minimize service types of writing down order details, 
making less errors, uh, ensure that food will come to the customer at the proper time and order, be able to track the food preparation status, uh, get more tips, and etc. cetera. Uh, those statements with outcomes can, uh, could be transformed into the goals. I hope that you got the point about the user goals. Now, a uh, few words about the users. Um, there's popular phrase, uh, jack of all trades um, has over time been modified. Now you frequently hear uh, jack of all trades, uh, master of none. So to create a product that must satisfy diverse audience of users, um, logic might tell you to make its functionality as broad as possible to accommodate the most people. Uh, this logic, however, is flawed. The best way to successfully accommodate a variety of users is to design for specific types of individuals with um, very specific needs. When you broadly and arbitrarily extend a product's functionality to, in, to include many constituencies, you increase the cognitive load and navigational overhead for all users. In other words, it becomes hard to use the product. Facilities that may please some users will likely interfere with the satisfaction of others. The key to this approach is to first choose the right individuals to design for. Users whose needs best represent the needs of a larger set of key constituents. When you prioritize these individuals, uh, so that needs of the most important users are met without compromising our ability to meet the needs of secondary users. Personas provide a powerful tool for communicating about the different types of users and their needs. And then deciding which users are the most important uh, to target in the design of form and, and behavior. Personas are crucial passage in the user-centered um, design process because they define expectations, consents, and motivations. And also, they are helping design teams to understand how to design a product that will satisfy user needs and for be a success. Person represent behavior patterns, not, not job descriptions. So let's dive deep into the process of creating user personas. First step is research. In this stage, you collect qualitative data about the user or potential user uh, through uh, field studies and interviews. You carry out uh, a competitor's analysis, uh, analysis and interview case talk stakeholder, stakeholders to, go, uh, to gather their requirements. When you are finished, you should be left with a set of instructions which describe how the product could be used. And here's the graph with the different user research uh, techniques. All of them can be proved by qualitative, why, uh, answering the question why, and quantitative, how many. And each of those um, could be split uh, to uh, attitudinal, what people say, and behavioral what people do. In this phase, we could use different techniques to define user goals by using qualitative and quantitative methods. But um, creators of user persona found the following uh, qualitative uh, research activities to be the most useful in, in, in their goal-directed design practice. So in rough order of uh, execution, kickoff meeting, literature review, product prototype and competitive audits, stakeholders interview, subject matter experts interviews, user and customer interviews, user observation, ethnographic field studies. So what happens during a uh, kickoff meeting? Also, uh, the project kickoff meeting isn't strictly a research activity. It contains an important uh, component of research. Um, it is, um, a great opportunity for designers to ask initial quick key questions of some of the most important stakeholders uh, gathered at the meeting. So those questions are, in my opinion, what is the product? Who will or does use it? 
what uh, do users need most? Why, um, which customers and users are the most important to the business? Or what challenges do the design team and the business face moving forward? Um, do, uh, who do you see as your biggest competitors and why? Uh, what internal and, and external literature you should, uh, you should, uh, or whole team sh uh, should look uh, to familiarize uh, themselves with the product or business. Now, after that, you know, it's always uh, important that a team that is working on product and on, on research would uh, do a literature review. Uh, pre or to or in parallel with stakeholders interviews, the design team should review any literature pertaining to the product or its domain. Internal documents including product uh, marketing plan, strate brand strategy, market research studies, user surveys and etc. Uh, industry reports uh, such as um, a business and technical journal articles. Uh, web searches for related or competing products, uh, news items, independent user forums, blog posts, and social media discussion topics. The design team should collect this literature and use it as a basis for developing questions to ask stakeholders and uh, subject matter experts. Mm. Pure are again in parallel um, with stakeholders and um, subject matter expert interviews. It is helpful for the design team to examine any existing version of prototype uh, of a product, as well as um, its chief uh, competitors. Doing so gives the design team a sense of a state of art and provides fuel for questions during the, um, these interviews. So how do you approach stakeholders interviews and who are uh, stakeholders? Generally speaking, a stakeholder is anyone with a, a authority uh, and or responsibility for the product being designed. Interviews with stakeholders should occur before um, user research uh, begins. Stakeholders discussion often inform how user research um, should be uh, conducted. It is more effective to interview each stakeholder in isolation rather than a uh, large uh, cross departmental uh, departmental group. Um, and there's some key uh, certain type of information on that is very important to gather from uh, stakeholders. Those are preliminary uh, preliminary product vision. Um, you may find that. Each business department has a slightly different and slightly incomplete perspective on the product to be designed. Part um, of the design approach, therefore, must involve harmonizing this perspective with those of um, users and customers. If there is, um, is, if there is um, a serious disconnect in vision among stakeholders, uh, that situation is a yellow flag to monitor and follow up on early in the process. Now, um, the second most important thing is budget and, sh uh, and schedule. Uh, uh, schedule. Uh, discussion on this topic often provides a reality check on the scope of a design effort and gives the management a decision point if um, user research indicates that a greater or maybe lesser scope is required uh, than technical constraints and opportunities. Another important determinant of design scope is a firm understanding of what is technically feasible given budget, time, and technology constraints. Um, it is also often uh, the case that a product is being developed to capitalize uh, on a new technology. And understanding the opportunities, opportunities uh, underlying this technology can help shape the product direction. Now, one of the most important things to ask stakeholders are business drivers. It is important for design team to understand what the business is trying to accomplish. This again leads to a decision point. Uh, should user research indicate a conflict between the business and user needs? Uh, and the design must, uh, as much as possible, create a win-win 
situation for users, customers, and providers of a product. Stakeholders' perception of the users. So stakeholders have re relationship with users, such as customer support, may have important insights that uh, will help you formulate your user research plan. You may also find that there are significant disconnects between some stakeholders' perception of their users and uh, what you discover in your research. This information can become an important discussion point with the management later in the process. Now, when you approach subject matter expert interviews, um, so it, it should be um, early in design, in design project. So, um, because such a, uh, subject matter um, experts are authorities on the domain within which uh, the product will operate. Uh, you need to remember that uh, SMEs are often expert users. The long experience with a product or its domain means that they may have grown accustomed to current interactions. They may also lean towards expert controls rather than interaction uh, designed to perpetual uh, intermediates. Uh, they are knowledgeable, but they are not designers. They may have many ideas on how to improve a product. Some of those may be valid and valuable, but the most useful piece of information to glean from this suggestion are the causative problems, uh, problems that lead to their proposed solution. Ask with users when you encounter a proposal solution. Ask um, uh, how it would help you or the users. So only in the interview, you need to make sure that uh, you secure this access to SMEs uh, in, in your early interviews, because uh, along the design process and research, you will need to talk with those uh, people. Now, when you approach customer interview, so uh, I need to clarify a few things. Customers and users can be two distinct groups. In our situation, the customer, customers may not use the application at all, but will ultimately still be the, be the one with the purchasing power who will make the decision to buy. When analyzing a customer, uh, one must take into account um, their goals in purchasing the product, their frustration with current solution, their decision process of purchasing a product of, uh, of the type you are designing, their role in installing, uh, maintaining, and managing your product. And uh, here is example um, table uh, whom to target uh, for customers in, this, in interviews. So example, if you want to decrease churn or reacquire uh, reacquire lapsed users, then use uh, for those interviews uh, only lapsed users. In, in my experience, creating customer journey map is very helpful. Uh, customer journey map reveals the step-by-step -step process of a customer's experience. It helps designers, uh, product managers, and engineers to understand how customers interact with your product and uncover opportunities for improvement. Um, for to, cr to create customer journey maps, I'm uh, I'm using the five Fs uh, framework. This is a acronym, uh, acronym and checklist uh, to help brainstorm the different stages of customer experience. So, what are those uh, five E's? So, it's entities how someone um, uh, someone attracted or made aware about the product, and how does the user begin engage. What is the core of the experience? Exit. How does a user complete or finish the experience? And uh, extend. What happens after uh, after um, after um, um, what happens after the experience? A customer journey map can help you uncover product info, uh, opportunities that could also serve as a questionnaire in customer interview. So. When you have done such a big job of uh, interviewing stakeholders, uh, subject matter experts, uh, in some cases, uh, if you will have change, uh, chance in that early stage to interview potential or existing customers, 
now you uh, are capable to create user persona hypothesis. Because the design must capture an entire range of user behaviors regarding a product, it is critical that the designer identify an appropriate diverse sample of users and user types when planning a series of interviews. Uh, based on, inf on information gleaned from uh, stakeholders, SMEs, and literature reviews, uh, you need to create a hypothesis that serve uh, as a starting point in determining what sort of users and potential users to interview. Few main things to define. What different sorts of people might use this product? How might their needs and behaviors vary? And what ranges of behaviors and type of environments need to be explored? Um, the best uh, way in our case to build persona, uh, personas in, um, in POS, uh, it's uh, role-based. So example, waiter, manager, bartender, and concierge, um, needs and behaviors and environments. So it could be type of restaurant, quick service restaurant, or character restaurant, um, fine dining, casual dining. So uh, the persona hypothesis is um, a first try at defining the different kinds of users and sometimes customers of a product. Uh, the hypothesis is the basis for in initial interview planning. Now let's jump to interview interviews of users. So when you have like a hypothesis, now you can find the person that needs this hypothesis. Users uh, of a product should be the main focus of design um, effort. They are the people who personally uh, use the product to accomplish goal, not their managers who are support team or sometimes even uh, those who buy. If you are redesigning or refining an existing product, it is important to speak to both current and potential users. These are people who do not currently use the product, but who are good candidates for using it in the future because they have needs that the product can meet and are the target market for the product. Interviewing both current and potential users illuminates the effect on the experience with the current version of all the product might have on how the user behaves and uh, thinks about things. Here's some information um, that we are interested in learning from users. So it's uh, the, the context of how the product or analogous system uh, fits into their lives or workflows, when and why, how the product is or will be used, domain knowledge from a user perspective, what uh, do users need to know to do their job, current tasks and activities, both uh, those where um, current product is required to accomplish and those it doesn't support, uh, goals and motivations for using a product and mental model, how users think about their jobs and activities, as well as what expectations users have about the product. Now, uh, in, I use a contextual inquiry. Uh, it's the most effective way to do ethnographic research. Um, so also, uh, I use contextual inquiry and fill out day in the live join them up. Um, so you can try use those also. Joining mobs go beyond simply capturing and representing data in a visual format to tell a story about users' experience from their perspective. Now, regarding contextual inquiry, according to Bayer and Holzbull app, um, it's based on master apprentice uh, model of learning, observing and asking questions of the user as if she is the master craftsman and the interviewer the new apprentice. Long story short, imagine that you are trying uh, to learn a new profession uh, and someone will guide you through his job uh, from A to Z. Now, uh, the modeling. Uh, so when you uh, interview all uh, possible type of customers, it's time uh, to model. During the modeling phase, uh, behavior and workflow patterns discovered by analyzing the field research and interviews are synthesized into domain and user models. Domain models can include the information flow and workflow diagrams to understand how the whole uh, 
process of using product, a product happens. So step one, group interview subjects by role. Step two, identify behavioral variables. Generally, we see the most important distinction between behavior and patterns emerge by focusing on the following types of um, variables. Activities, what the user does, uh, frequency and volume. Attitudes, how user thinks about the product domain and technology. Aptitudes, uh, what education and training the user has, ability to learn. Uh, motivations, why the user is engaging the product domain and skills, um, user abilities related to the product domain. Those are like five core things that distinguish, uh, you know, uh, different type of users. Now in step three, uh, you should map interview subjects uh, to behavior variables. Uh, after you are satisfied uh, that you have um, identified the set, uh, the set of significant behavioral variables exhibited by your interview subjects. The next step is to map each interview against each variable. For example, uh, someone might be price-oriented, the second one could be a service-oriented. In step four, uh, you should identify significant behavior patterns. After you have mapped all interview subjects, look for cluster of subjects that or occur across uh, multiple ranges of variables. A set of subjects who cluster in six to eight different variables will likely represent a significant behavior pattern that will form the basis of persona. Some specialized uh, roles may exhibit only one significant pattern, but typically you will find two or even three such patterns. Now in step five, it's um, synthesizing uh, uh, synthesize uh, characteristic and define uh, the goals for each uh, significant behavior pattern. You need to um, identify. You must synthesize details from your data. These details should include the following uh, at the minimum: the behaviors themselves, activities, and the motivations behind them. Uh, the use environment, uh, frustration and pain points related to the behavior using current solution, demographics associated with the behavior, skills, experience or ability related, uh, relating to the behavior, attitudes and emotion associated with the behavior, uh, relevant interactions with other people, products or services and alternate or competing ways of doing the same thing, especially, especially analog techniques. Now, in step, uh, step six, uh, check for completeness and redundancy. Sometimes um, few personas might cover the same set of uh, defining uh, objects and subjects. In step seven, uh, you should design persona types. Uh, there are six types of personas, and they are typically designed in roughly uh, the order listed here. Primary, secondary, supplemental, customer, served, and negative. Uh, in step eight, you need to expand the description of attributes and behaviors. The best thing is uh, to narrative quickly, um, to, uh, the, the, the best narrative quickly introduces the persona in terms of his job uh, or lifestyle. It briefly sketches a day in his life, uh, including peeves, uh, concerns, and interests that have um, direct bearing on the product. Uh, the details should be an expansion of your list of characteristics with additional data derived from your observation and interviews. The narrative, uh, the narrative should express what the persona is looking for uh, in the product by uh, by by way of um, uh, of um, conclusion. So uh, about different type of personas. So primary persona are the main target of interface design. Uh, product can have only one primary persona per interface. Uh, but it's possible for some products, especially enterprise products, to have multiple distinct interfaces, each targeted at a distinct uh, primary persona. Secondary persona. A secondary persona is mostly satisfied with the primary persona interface. However, it has specific additional needs that can be accommodated without 
upsetting the product's ability to serve the primary persona. Now, uh, the supplemental persona. Users persona that are not primary or secondary are supplemental personas. Their needs are completely represented by a combination of primary and secondary personas and are completely satisfied by the solution we devise uh, for one of the, our primaries. Any number of supplemental personas can be associated with an interface. Often um, political personas, the ones added to the class to address stakeholders' assumptions, uh, become supplemental, uh, supplemental personas. Now, we talked a lot about uh, customer personas. Customer personas addresses the needs of customers, not end users. Typically, customer personas are treated like secondary personas. However, in some enterprise environments, some customer persona might be primary persona for their own administrative, uh, administrative uh, interfaces. Now, uh, the self persona uh, are somewhat different from the persona types already discussed. They are not users of the product, but they are directly affected by the use of the product. So, uh, in, in case if waiter is a primary persona, a restaurant customer is a self persona. Now, um, a negative persona, also sometimes called anti persona, are uh, used to communicate uh, to stakeholders and product team members that the product is not being built on uh, to a specific type of users. Uh, good candidates for negative persona are often, example, it could be technology savvies or, or, or early adopter, like it can be criminals, um, pranksters, trolls, or IT specialists. So, in summary, um, for user personas profile, uh, do include summarizing descriptions of all significant behavior patterns in your narrative. Do not include excessive fictional descriptions. Include just enough details to cover basic demographics and to weave the behavior patterns into a story. Do not add levels of details to your behavior descriptions that you don't know, you didn't um, observe. Do not introduce solution to, into your persona narrative. Rather, highlight um, pain points. And uh, here is an example of user persona template uh, that um, we might use. As you can see, the user persona profile template can be quite custom. Um, in this template, I used few blocks demographics to show some core cool things related to the persona. Um, if the persona is young, old, IT skills, her position, uh, role, story, where is the user coming from, what's their situation and struggle uh, of using our product, role description, what type of things she does in her job, uh, goals related to the job, uh, pain points, main on the self jobs, uh, our possibilities to win those uh, users, personas, uh, hearts, and blog with survey result of those actual users that might fall, uh, might fall into that user persona description. So for customer persona, we could also add even more data, example, customer journey mark, or in some cases, uh, it could be uh, show the day in life. So I hope this uh, uh, course, um, this um, presentation will help you to build user persona with more confidence. So if you have questions, feel free to, to ask. And thank you.